Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Better Call Paul, attorney at Bor, and this video we're breaking down episode 1 of She-Hulk. The new MCU entry is filled with easter eggs, callbacks to the comics, and a lot of things you might have missed if you don't sit around watching Marvel movies all day. Now as always we start off with the Marvel Studios logo, which features a couple of new additions off the back of the new movies. We can catch Doctor Strange featuring in the Multiverse of Madness, as well as Jane Foster from Thor Love and Thunder. From here we go to Jennifer Walters on a green background, which is of course a nice little visual reference to the character she transforms into. Here we see her delivering a speech about power and responsibility. What is the responsibility of those with power? Now there's clear nods here to the with great power comes great responsibility speech by both Uncle Ben and Aunt May throughout the Marvel Universe. However, this is also talking about the power and responsibility that she herself has. Throughout the episode she says she doesn't want to be a hero, and instead she just wants to keep practicing law. Eventually though she steps up to the plate and in a courtroom takes down Titania, played by Jamila Jamil. Now we see that her law degree is from the University of California, and there's also a UCLA mug. Though most of the episode is set in Mexico, we do know that the majority of the series will take place in LA. The show itself will be heavily based on the dance slot run, which followed her being hired to help out superhumans. The comic actually opens with Jen getting her law degree at university, but she's left alone and doesn't really have any friends. Throughout the comic she prefers to stick to her She-Hulk form because she can't accept who she really is, and she lives a life of partying which this show also seems to be doing. On her book cabinet we can catch a figurine of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one I believe is Michelle Obama, and to spell it out, there's a book that says Badass Women. Now she's going through her closing arguments to her paralegal colleague and friend Nikki, as well as Dennis who too features in the comics. He wants to deliver the argument himself, showing that men, bloody men, that they're always trying to get in a woman's way. Not me though, I love them, and that's why everyone should hit the thumbs up button, and also subscribe because I'm, I'm such a nice guy. Now Dennis also says that Jen should listen to him and not his paralegal friend, and this is very much reflected in Bruce who too thinks that Jen should listen and do exactly what he says. Once she brushes them out her office, she also breaks the fourth wall for the very first time. This is something that the character is known for in the comics and it constantly allows her to explain what's going on and also make offhand jokes. This show is very much about abing stuff like Ellie McBeal, which too used similar techniques. The procedural law drama will be bringing across lots of big characters and f Daredevil, who we really want to see is of course Frogman. Now at this point Jennifer also says the following. I am a Hulk uh, and I'm guessing you're not going to be able to focus on this fun lawyer show until you know all about that so let me get you up to speed. Cut back to the road trip with Jen and Bruce and we get this interesting line that's sort of drowned out by the narration. Yeah, it worked. I mean my arm started to heal and no one thought it was, it was actually... Yes, that Bruce. Now if you cast your mind back to Endgame then you might remember that carrying out the blip caused him to severely damage his arm. However, he showed up in the Shang-Chi post credit scene back in human form with his arm still in the sling that he had at the end of Endgame. We get it explained here and it turns out that the device we saw in Shang-Chi actually puts him back in human form so that he can save money on the CGI budget if they need him to do it. Now he also points out that Jen eats Cheetos with chopsticks so she doesn't get Cheeto fingers. They end up doing this later on in the episode but the main mystery of the entire thing revolves around if Steve Rogers is a virgin or not. Something that definitely matters and we all 100% want to know as the guy didn't meet up with Peggy until after the events of Endgame. There are further links to that movie with Jen talking about Steve's ass in the post credit scene, which of course calls back to Ant-Man naming it America's ass in the aforementioned film. The credits also have her with a board and picture of Steve in his original USO uniform. There's an image of Peggy Carter along with a chorus girl that appeared in the show. Now we finally finally discover that he lost his v-card to a girl in 1943 as part of the USO show, so yes, Captain America, fuck! This finally closes off the biggest mystery since new rock stars asked what he was cooking. <laughs> I tell you, I'm, I'm good friends with the CEO of new rock stars, Philip, but if he sees this video, I'm f***ing dead. Now this scene massively alters Jennifer's origins in the comics, simplifying it by quite a lot, whilst also potentially setting something up for Hulk in the future. In the source material, Jen was the daughter of an LA County Sheriff who died in a car crash. The day that Bruce showed up to tell her that he was the Hulk, she was shot by a group of gangsters and in the hospital, Bruce ended up donating his blood to her since there were no other donors available. 
The mobsters then arrived to finish the job when she was laid up in bed, and it was during this that she transformed into She-Hulk. It was also during her first major arc in the comics that she fought Titania in the Supreme Court, so they are kind of playing fast and loose with stuff, especially the blood transfusion. Now in the comics, the transfusion is what also allowed her to become She-Hulk, whereas yet yeah, it's way more simple with the blood just dripping into one of her cuts. However, we do get hints towards other comics if the Sakaar ship is anything to go by. Though this looks exactly like the Grandmaster's vessel, we learn it's a courier from the planet that's there to deliver a message. Yeah, Sakaar and Class A courier craft. They're probably trying to deliver a message. I gotta get to the bottom of that. Now if the rumours about us getting a World War Hulk movie are true, then there are some things that this could be. In the comics, Bruce ended up living on Sakaar after the Illuminati fired him into space so that he would stop destroying things on Earth. They believed they'd sent him to a peaceful planet, but when he arrived he was sold into slavery and he ended up becoming a gladiator. Sakaar was overseen by an evil emperor, but throughout the run, Hulk created an uprising and he overthrew him. Hulk became the leader of the planet and he ended up getting married. However, the ship he was sent in exploded, killing her and many Sakarians, and he returned to Earth in order to get revenge. This led into the events of World War Hulk, which was a gigantic battle across America involving lots of heroes. Hulk also learned that he had a son on Sakaar, and it is possible that this ship came out to inform him of something along these lines. Hulk of course spent years on the planet, and who knows what he got up to, but I can imagine that Hulk f Now the ship forces them off the road, and we get somewhat of an homage to the original 70s series. The first transformation in that involved Bruce's car breaking down, and he ended up changing into the Hulk after getting angry about not being able to move it. Jen also has on similar clothes to how Bruce did there, with them having light shirts on that rip apart. However, whereas we got the Hulk on full display in the original, here we see her change in the reflection of the car, which too has a greenish tint to it. Hulk tells her to get away, reminding me a lot of when he warned Black Widow in the original Avengers movie. She runs through the forest, and in true Hulk fashion, wakes up in the middle of nowhere. This is something that was too a staple of the 70s show, and also the Incredible Hulk movie. Due to him travelling to South America, it makes me wonder if the setup he has near Mexico was created because of his closeness to the continent. Now we don't know too much about the ins and outs of what he did when he was down there, but he roughly spent about 5 years before he settled in Brazil. Now blood also popped up in that movie, and it being leaked into a bottle at the factory he worked at gave us not only a Stanley cameo, but it also led General Ross directly to him. Now Jen enters a bar at this point and we can see a QR code on the wall which will give you a free She-Hulk comic if you go and scan it. In the bathroom she cleans herself up and we also see Ms Marvel's symbol on a chalkboard. The Avengers A also looks like an anarchy sign and we can see a spider there too. Outside the bar some damn punks start harassing her and then she transforms which is when Hulk dives in to stop it kicking off. Jen then awakens in Mexico at the Hulk retreat which is where she starts her training and now, it's time for Jared's Easter Eggs. Jared's Easter Eggs. Now, this episode is filled with t-shirts with band names on them. Jennifer is rocking a Led Zeppelin shirt, and then Hulk is later wearing a Nirvana Nevermind t-shirt. We find out that this whole thing is set up by Tony Stark, so more than likely, all of these t-shirts actually belong to him. Because guess what? If you remember all the way back in Avengers, he's wearing a Black Sabbath t-shirt. And then if we jump over to Ragnarok, Bruce Banner is also wearing a Rio t-shirt from Duran Duran. We also see at one point what looks to be the helmet of the Iron Legion. This is all busted up, but does have a very similar design to the very first form that Ultron took. I like how <laughs> Ultron just took one look at the internet and decided us f had to go. I mean, two girls, one cup? Great decision, my dude. Now, this is probably left behind as a reminder to both Bruce and Tony because both of them together created Ultron in the MCU. Now Bruce is back in the Smart Hulk form as the inhibitor device is still bust up. We learn this is the Gamma Lab that he brought up in Endgame and this too is shown in more detail in a deleted scene for the movie. RIP science bros, and it's clear Tony's death still hangs over him quite a lot. They had a big friendship that we weren't really privy to, but Bruce of course popped up in Iron Man 3 with the movie being revealed to be a therapy session for Tony. We learn that the pair built a bar together but that Tony would just get drunk and moan about Steve. 
Bruce interestingly was used as a mediator between the two and in Infinity War he was the one who of course reached out to Cap using Tony's special cell phone. Bruce also talks about some of the times he's changed and he references several of his films. He brings up how he fell out of a plane which is a nod to either the Incredible Hulk or potentially Ragnarok when he changed on Asgard. He also talks about how a robot knocked him out. I don't remember Ultron doing this so potentially this is a nod to the Hulkbuster fight. Might have been knocked out by Ultron but I can't remember every single moment from all 34 of these MCU things cause look I need some space in my brain for happy memories. I already can't remember my wedding day cause I replaced it with a boss coming over for dinner at the end of One Division episode 1. Please, please just let, let me remember my kids names please, please. Now Bruce clears up that it's only because he and Jen share similar genetic factors that the pair can synthesize gamma. As a kid I used to think sticking my head in the microwave with the door open would give me superpowers but instead it just turned me into a YouTuber. This is something that has been explained in more depth in the comics with only really Bruce and Jen being able to become the Hulk if they're blasted with gamma rays. However other people can synthesize this blood and use it on themselves. Now we discover that Bruce also completely healed his arm when he was studying her. We also get some musical stings from Endgame as he destroys her blood in the incinerator. It turns out Bruce worries that there could be other Hulks created if her blood gets out and we've seen this in the comics. There's a ton of Hulk offshoots such as A-Bomb, Red She-Hulk, The Leader and so on and so on. The latter was of course teased at all the way back in The Incredible Hulk and it's going to be interesting to see if he pops up in this series. Now Bruce really worries she's not going to be able to control her Hulk side as he of course had difficulty not turning into a rage filled monster. He puts her through her paces, the first being trying to trigger her transformation. In a blink and you'll miss it moment you might notice that just before the blade starts spinning that you can catch the Stark logo on them. Jen then busts out and Bruce worries she's gonna go wild but I kind of feel the tension was robbed a bit here cause we already know she's gonna be in control. Thanks trailers. Spoiler alert. <laughs> now Bruce tries to talk to her like she's a stray horse mimicking the sun's getting real low speech that was performed by both Black Widow and Thor. In a further callback to Ragnarok Bruce also talks about there being another hand on the wheel. You really don't feel like there's another hand on the wheel at all? No. This is a metaphor he also used when describing what it's like to be Bruce and the Hulk. I mean in the past I always felt like Hulk and I each had a hand on the wheel but this time it's like he had the keys of the car and I was locked in the trunk. He wants people to not see her as a monster because that reputation never goes away. And the pair start to meditate in a scene that feels very reminiscent of the one from the Incredible Hulk in which Bruce tried to control his anger. There was also a deleted scene in that movie in which Bruce did it in order to try and lower his temper with him taking the position that he does here. We know this series is going to be acknowledging that movie quite a lot with Abomination once more being played by Tim Roth. <laughs> now Hulk sounds an air horn off in her face known as the Mighty Honk. This causes her to crack the bed which is something that also happened in the dance slot run when she transformed whilst she was in one. Jen wears a Mexico t-shirt and she later dons a one with I Love Mexico on it. This is similar to the I Love LA one that she had in the source material. Hulk also gets her to wear spandex so that they aren't constantly tearing through their clothes and don't wake up naked. The pair then do a training montage with Jen also punching the ground at one point. This also references a cover from the Dan Slot series and we get a further nod to it when they go to get drunk. During the comics after Jen was kicked out of Avengers Mansion and fired from her job she went to a bar to get drunk. They have a section in which they explain how she can't do this which is almost verbatim to how it's said here. Now Jen breezes through the training with ease and she also says that she can control her anger because she's used to doing it as a woman. It's a bit, a bit kind of heavy handed isn't it and it feels like the sort of thing they do in one of Vought's commercials featuring Brave Maeve. Now I'm gonna out myself as a massive sexist that will no doubt become the next Henry VIII cause there's no going back from this but I think my big, I think yeah brace yourself, my big issue with the first episode is that there's no real room for growth. I think it's a basic part of writing a main character that you start off with them having flaws and eventually they overcome these. Perfect example of this is Prey which features Nauru slowly training, learning from the encounters she experiences and then when she comes out on top at the end it feels more triumphant. Now in the case of She-Hulk 
There's nothing in this episode that actually holds her back, and from the off, she's perfect at everything. Even the Titania fight at the end, she just changes, sorts her out, and that's it. There's no real struggle here, which I think is going to be difficult to maintain over the next 8 weeks. Probably sounds like male fragility to some people, but to me, yeah. The most interesting characters in the Disney Plus shows have been Wanda and Loki because they're flawed. Now, they might do what they did in the comics, where she has to wrestle with accepting what side of her is the real her, but I kind of wish they'd put some obstacles in place so she wasn't immediately better at everything than everyone else. Now, she seems to not really want to be She-Hulk, so it'll probably end up being about her accepting her role as a hero. Now, because of her getting through everything, Jen just wants to go home, and she goes to take the jeep. I love how she has to adjust the seats as Hulk was, of course, riding it, and it all ends up kicking off because Jen knows best. The pair end up fighting with Hulk busting out his signature thunderclap move that's been a feature of the comics, movies and games. Jen quickly learns how to do it herself and the fight leads to them breaking Bruce's bar. The pair end up fixing it up and then Jen breaks the fourth wall. This is the first time it happens chronologically and shout out to our editor Matt for saying that the first time she did this was in the sensational She-Hulk. She then carves the initials JW into it to go with Tony and Bruce's. Cut to the present again, and Jen going against who I believe is Holden Holloway. In the comics, he ran the law firm that dealt with superhuman affairs, and he ended up hiring Jen after she was fired from hers. Now, during the trial early on, she ended up being called out by the Avengers, and this caused a recess. The next day, when the jury ended up deliberating, they came back with a rapid response, which many believed was because she was a superhero. Her boss thought that this could cause issues and possibly get verdicts overturned due to mistrials because of her influence. So he let her go, and then Holden stepped in and took her under his wing. Jen has dealt with lots of high-profile cases in the Marvel Universe, including the Stanford bombing that featured in Civil War. She represented several of the heroes who refused to join the Superhuman Registration Act, and they might even pull across parts of that storyline, as not everyone signed the Sokovian Accords. Jen takes off her shoes, and we watch as she transforms, with her hand changing first. This is a similar motion to what Bruce did in Avengers during the always angry scene. We then get a fly, a flying drop kick. It looks great, that. And Jen beats Titania pretty easily. No idea who she's there for, but the case in the comics was for Antarctic Vibranium, which had been poisoning lots of people. Titania seems to be there, looking like the ultimate warrior for another reason, and the pair had a major rivalry in the comics. This was also explored during the dance slot run, and after she goes out like a chump, I'm expecting to see her back. Now it's a bit of a sloppy fight, and I don't know if it's intentionally meant to look sh** because it's imitating Ali McBeal, or if it's just genuinely sh**. Either way, that wraps up the episode, and we see the credits play out. This contains court scenes with Jen practicing law in her She-Hulk form. We see her with an Avengers mug that's likely a murder weapon, lots of cheese puffs, a spandex sail, and the Captain America virgin board. Looks like the kind of thing your mates make about you as well, mate. Now it all plays out to Eve's Who's That Girl, and we also get a dating profile, shield file, Venice Beach workout scene, and some people dressed as the Avengers outside Lao's Chinese theatre. These are all presented like a courtroom sketch, which we also see an artist doing, kinda tying this all together. That closes it out after the post credit scene, and I kinda went over my thoughts a bit in this, uh, but just to sum it up, I thought it was an okay episode. Hulk is actually my favourite Marvel character, so I'm always happy to see the guy, I just felt like this was a bit unbalanced pacing wise. They spent a lot of time doing experiments, training, and all in all, it didn't really amount to much as there wasn't really anything Jennifer had to overcome. So the time we spent here, I think could have been better spent elsewhere, and normally when someone's an expert at everything, they use that time for character development, but here, we didn't really progress all that much. I also feel like the transformation massively toned down the comics as that had quite a dangerous origin story for her, whereas here, yeah, they just go off the road and some blood gets in her arm. Really robs the stakes that created her in the comics and then coming to grips with her powers is also glossed over too. Should call it the mid-credible Hulk, because as far as origin stories go, I think this is one of the MCU's most forgettable. Probably in the minority, as my editor Matt really loved the show, I just feel like I wish we'd seen a bit more in terms of growth and where she's going to go. Might end up firing her next time like in the comics and then she's got to climb her way back up. But just taking this as all I've seen so far, yeah, I kind of feel that there could have been a bit more growth. Obviously, we're really, really early on and the show can turn it around for me, so I'm not counting it out yet. 
just feel a bit meh on the on the first episode. Now, I don't know if you've been following me for a while or, or whatever, but I normally don't rate origin stories that much because it's all sort of going through the motions, so maybe next time I'll enjoy it a lot more. Hopefully you join me and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. Now we're running a competition right now and giving away three copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of September and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, then make sure you check out our breakdown of the original plan for Marvel, which will be linked on screen right now. We go over what Kevin Feige originally wanted to do with the characters that he had, and it's definitely worth checking out if you just want to know a bit of trivia. If not, then thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.